Hey, thank you for tuning in to the Art of SBA Lending. I have Pam Fry with me today. Pam is a 20 plus year veteran of SBA Lending, and I worked with her for four years. She was my credit manager at Ready Capital, and I truly think she's one of the most talented people we have in our industry. She's the SBA Lending team lead now at Lakeland Bank, a bank out of New Jersey, and I'm really interested in hearing her story having worked at some of the largest SBA lenders in the country, so stick around. Hey, Pam, good to see you. Hey, Ray, how's it going? Going well. How you been? Thank- good. It's been a little while. Thank you for yeah. coming on. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. I'm honored. Oh, well, the honor is all mine. So I want to I wanna start with the same question I've been asking everyone, just because I'm yes. interested. How did you get into SBA? That's a great question. Um, so I had actually, I grew up in retail banking, uh, moved into commercial lending in my mid twenties and a, a former colleague of mine, uh, moved to CIT and she brought, she basically brought me with her to CIT. We were doing inventory financing at the time and they were going to shut down my department. So hmm. right, bef- right around that time, uh, C- uh CIT bought new court. And Newcourt had the SBA lending division. So it gave me an opportunity instead of potentially being laid off, it gave me the opportunity to move into a different opportunity, uh, which was SBA. I took advantage of it and uh, I started as an underwriter there in 2000. At CIT. Working for CIT, yeah, CIT Small Business Lending. I think at that time they were probably, their volume was probably around 250 million a year somewhere around that. So they, they'd been in business a number of years before that, but that's when I joined with, uh, that's, that's how I got into SBA. That probably made them maybe a top 10, top 20 lender in the country at that time, probably, probably a top 10, mm-hmm. right? Probably. So they were, so you went from like a local kind of bank deal mm-hmm. to one of the top SBA lenders in the country, which was actually, I think the number one seven, a lender, at least one of those years leading up into the great recession. And uh, I think at one point they had like a hundred BDOs and it was just mm-hmm. huge. And so mm-hmm. what was it like working in that type of environment? So that's a great question. And leading up to the recession, they were actually the number one FDA lender nine years in a row. Oh. Yeah. So I, I was trying to think back of, of the days and the way CIT's FDA department was structured, it was two different offices, an office in New Jersey, an operations office in New Jersey, and an operations office in Colorado. So we worked mostly independently of each other. They had their own credit and closing staff and BDOs, and the Eastern region in Jersey had their own as well. Um, I would say there were probably about 10 underwriters for the Eastern region back when I started. And um, it was interesting because we were getting our feet wet. You know, what happened a year later after I joined 9-11? So that was, you know, a change. We had moved offices, and but we were growing. And we were trying to start taking advantage of technology back then. Um, Mm. But the the name of the game was volume. You know, we we wanted to be the number one SBA lender in the nation, and we wanted to stay the number one SBA lender in the nation. Um, And honestly, flash forward 21 years, I am in contact with so many people still from my experiences at CIT. Okay. So CIT was very high volume at the time. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I've worked in those types of situations and, you know, today, like doing high volume um, with the technology now that we all have and everyone's working from home and can be so much more efficient. Was it, do you think it was as busy during that time as it is now, or is like now at least like where I'm at or where we were at before at Ready Capital, do you think it, it was much worse in terms of just overworking and like stress and stuff like that? From what I remember back then, I mean, CIT isn't every SBA lending shop, right? So they had, they had a, a large staff uh, and they had dedicated staff for the underwriting phase, the closing phase, the servicing phase. Uh, I think that now those, some of those roles 
tend to blend together. Um, so back then I was strictly underwriting. We had the other roles again, but I worked directly with the BDOs. It did feel high volume then. It, it's high volume now in a different way though. And, and I can't even look at the last 18 months because that's been the pandemic. And Right. It's been the craziness with adding PPP on top of regular SBA production. Yeah, it's, it's definitely then. been a totally, I think the word yeah. people keep saying is unprecedented times. Have you yeah. heard this yeah. phrase? <laughs> oh, a little too much. And to go back a little bit, you know, I was in my 30s in, um, when I was with CIT. And it was different. Life was different then, right? I'm, I had young children, so it was trying to juggle between a job advancing in my job, being a mom, you know, all of that. And, uh, but it, it felt different. And I think because the technology wasn't advanced back then, in some ways life was easier then. Uh, yeah. I, right. I had it. I had a desktop. I had a desk phone. You left your computer at work. You didn't get called mm. off hours. That's a big really one. work on the weekend. Yeah. You can't work at night and weekends. It's almost become a norm for so many people yep. in our, in our yep. world now. That's crazy. Yep. So you were, uh, at this big company, did they get together every year or something like for a big company event? Great question. Yes. They had the annual sales conferences. I think those were a big part of the relationship building there. And right. I mean, we've worked at a different place together, but I, I think that's what makes the difference between um, teams that work, that credit has to meet sales, has to meet closing, that, that face-to-face, shaking hands, you know, sharing a meal together or whatnot, oh, having yeah. these side conversations, building that type of um, person relationship, not just a work relationship, but I think I, they were great. And um it really brought the, the different roles together. So you're at this uh, big high volume shop, CIT. I also have a ton of friends, you know, that were there uh, and places like that. But then uh, 2008 happens. That was the big, you know, great recession. It really brought CIT to an end, I think, to mm-hmm. pretty much. So I know when um, the pandemic happened here um, in last year, like in, March and, you know, I'm working every day, I'm building my pipeline. We're going on, we're going on with our business. And then pretty much it's, it seems like almost overnight, all of that just goes by the wayside. You totally Mm -hmm. pivot your attention somewhere else. All of this is gone now. Now your focus is totally different. Like what was the vibe at that point when you guys realized like this, this kind of ride was over and now we have to deal with, you know, this next big phase? That's a great question. And, and uh, I had joined where I am now in late 2018, uh, really to build the program. All right. We were, we were a small shop, you know, I'm going to say maybe five or six loans a year. Uh, and we wanted to grow it. And that was the main reason why they brought me on. So shortly after that, um, the, the team, the lender and the and the other admin left the department. So I was by myself for the better part of 2019 until later in the year when I was able to hire an under a dedicated portfolio manager and a dedicated admin. So I was I was really raring to rock in two, in 2020. All right, I had my team. We were ready to go. We were starting to build a, a regular SBA pipeline. Then then the pandemic hit. Um, so I started working remotely in Mar- at the end of March 2020, and it was, it, it, I, I can't explain the impact that it had on not just my department, but even the bank in general. Um, overnight, we went from being a pretty much a fully in-person company to a almost exclusively remote company other than our branches and whatnot that, you know, you, you can't do branching, branch um, roles remotely, but we, we had to, we had to flip a switch and go from, like I said, in person to remote the onset of PPP. I don't think we were, anyone was prepared for what it was going to actually look like. Um, you know, we had it, we had a short window of time to really get ready. Uh, we were not as 
technologically advanced as we are today. And we, we had a little bit more of a manual process in the first, let's say, weekend that we had opened PPP. We, we got over 1,200 applications for PPP. And it was insane. Uh, we, had, we had staff from all over the bank working on this, um, this program. And we knew how important it was because it's our customers, it's our small businesses. And, you know, who knew that there was talk that it would last two weeks. There was not, <laughs> not PPP, but, you know, COVID, oh. Um, right. Who knew that it would last as long as it would, that it would result in a second round of funding. Um, it did. It, it crippled my, my SBA, uh, my regular SBA business. So I, I managed the, the I, I managed the PPP process more so from a high level. Like I wasn't the one and my team wasn't the one that was actually processing all of the transactions. Like I said, we had hundreds of people at the bank that were oh, wow. um, supporting the, the, the process between working with the customers, between reviewing the applications, between, um, you know, the, the credits, the credit approvals, the submitting to SBI. So um, once the initial um, funding round ended, I was able to pick pick up again on the regular SBA business side, but it was slow because, you know, shortly after that, now you're starting into the forgiveness. Um, again, I, I wasn't exclusively involved in it. I was overseeing the program a little, a little more higher level, um, but it did have an impact. And I would say that 2020 was, you know, a, a, a wash of regular SBA business. It was very minimal, um, which, Coming from, you know, the year before and, you know, when I, when I was hired in late 2018, there wasn't a whole lot of activity al already on the SBA side. So 2020 was, was supposed to be a good year, but since late September, uh, we've really picked up on the regular SBA program. And then once the, the Fed uh, introduced the, the fee waivers and the 90% mm -hmm. guarantee, you know, that picked it up a lot as well. So yeah. I, I think this year we're going to have the best year we've ever had in regular SBA financing in the history of. And um, a lot of today, people are, a lot of people are, are there right now. I mean, it yeah. is a really good year. I remember when, yeah. you know, I was at ready capital still when all that went down and, you know, we turned into a PPP lender overnight and we were in the mm -hmm. zoom, zoom, you know, meeting mm -hmm. every day. There's like, I think like 30 of us. Mm -hmm. and we were all, you know, we we're figuring it out as we go. And someone would be like, Hey, yep. wh what is, how, what do you do in this scenario? Yep. And Camo was right there the whole time too, like in the trenches, yep. like doing these things. Yep. And he'd be like, I don't know, like <laughs> let's yep. figure it out together. It was so crazy. I mean, I felt like we were on the front lines kind of, of the battle of saving the small businesses because yep. you couldn't just say like, I don't want to get involved in this. Like right. you had to, um, you, you had, had to, to step up. Yeah. Yep. So, so, but it almost seemed like at at the start of this, it was like, you could almost see like, there's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel. A lot of people right. were saying V shape recession and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But in 2008, like it's, I, I imagine that was much worse where you're just like, we're just like, this is it. And then it just led to just like a lot of layoffs and just shutting mm -hmm. down of that whole mm -hmm. thing. And yeah. then, and then you ended up going to like a consulting company or mm -hmm. something like that, an SBA mm -hmm. consulting company. And you were there for, mm -hmm like about four years, I think. Mm -hmm. And then who approached you for the ready cap situation? Um, that's a great question. So, and just to back up a little bit, where I saw 08 was different. I mean, you go through recessions, right? And you come out of them eventually. But with that, that was the whole too big to fail. That mm -hmm. was when CIT filed bankruptcy. You know, they, they didn't know they weren't going to get that additional money there was basically the cease and desist on SBA because they wanted us to form a bank holding company and all that. So, Oh, wow. Well, there's a lot I there. Saw, yeah. So, you know, we went from a, I think we funded just under a billion dollars in SBA loans in 07 to almost nothing in 08 and 09. <laughs> and so I, I chose to leave in 2010 and I found um, it was a commercial loan review consulting firm. Uh, they did not just SBA review, but um, that was that was one of the pieces that I was involved with, and for that that uh, firm was in New York City, and I live in New Jersey. The 
So I commuted to New York City every day. And towards the end, it was basically about an hour and 45 minute commute each way. Oh, wow. So I lost. I lost three and a half hours of my life. And, and for personal reasons, I needed to get my job back to New Jersey. Yeah. So, you know, I, I kept in contact with a lot of the different uh, players from CIT who moved to ReadyCap. And I, I don't know who approached who. I probably reached out to them. Um, but, it, you know, prior to them uh, moving over to ReadyCap, there was really nothing to talk about. So once, once, once ReadyCap bought the, the CIT SBA license, and now they knew they needed to start up shop. That was when there was reason to talk. And that was late 2014, right? That was late 2014, yes. And actually, I think it, was, it started at the Nagel Conference in May that year, my, my oh. conversations with, with them. Oh, and wow. it took until December for it to actually happen. Well, you were one um, of the first people there. I mean, it was before it even started, before it made the first loan as ReadyCap. You, mm -hmm. you were there, you were one of the handful of people that were kind of involved mm -hmm. in starting what ended up becoming, you know, a top 10 lender mm -hmm. in the country. So yeah, I was the first credit person. So the, the credit and closing department consisted of the chief credit officer, me, and the closing manager. What was like the vision they were kind of talking to you about at that point of like where this thing is going to go? Well, I mean, we knew what the potential could be having been at CIT. Uh, and I think that that was a vision they were ultimately looking for. And there was, there was a lot of excitement because we, we were in a, a large um, office. So you saw a lot of empty mm. cubicles and you saw the vision like we're going to grow into this. Uh, and slowly we started hiring more staff. We, we were hiring the BDOs. We were starting to see some volume. And it, it got even more and more and more exciting because we, we could see that we were growing, uh, knowing what the potential could be, having been so involved at, at CIT. You know, a lot, of, a lot of the team that was at CIT came back in some cases or um, was already still there. The, you know, the back office function staff was, was primarily still um, CIT staff, but uh, it, it, was, it was exciting. Right. It really was exciting to be a part of something that was starting all over. Yeah. Um, having, having to figure out how we wanted to do it, um, getting the, pl the right players in, in place. So. And so I came, cool. I came in about two months after you, right? Mm -hmm. There was really no salespeople there. I mean, I think basically, essentially, like it was me, Charlie Johnson, mm -hmm. and Lisa Murgatroyd, who was mm -hmm. some in like the inside sales, I think at CIT. Yep. And then she, she Correct. became like an outbound kind of BDO. So us yep. three were like the three first uh, BDOs. And so what were you thinking when me before, <laughs> you know, me and Charlie are flying to New Jersey and you're going to meet the sales team. And then, you know, the yep. next batch comes in. What, what are you, what are you thinking at that point? So I obviously knew Lisa yeah. and I think for you, especially it was like, who is this Ray Drew guy? that knows, you know, what, what does he know about SBA lending? You know, at least Very little. Charlie, Charlie Johnson, I had never met before. It was okay here. It, it's becoming real. You know, we, we need you guys. We need the sales team in order for us to be able to do our job. So it was, it was, it was great to see that we were starting to bring people on. Yeah. And then we were making it happen. Again, the PLP was the big thing that first Get year. You or, yep. you know, very uh, involved in getting those first couple of deals through so that yep. we can apply. That was, yep. that was hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still remember some of the deals too, that we worked on. I, I do too. They're all coming <laughs> back in my head, but you yeah. want to know something that, that also um, prompted me to build relationships with the SBA. So because mm. of, because of that initial process where we couldn't um, submit our loans PLP, we were working directly with Citrus Heights, and there's there are people that I still call from back then um, because of because of that experience having to try to build our our portfolio to get the PLP. Thanks to your deals. It's, yep, exactly. So, <laughs> and you know, I really, I really, really enjoyed working with you during that that period, and like I that. just, I think you were, you know, and you're you've been in credit you're more in sales and management, you're in everything right now, but like you were in credit for a large portion mm -hmm. of your career. And I think, you know, you, you stood out as a credit person, as a leader, and that was recognized, but why, 
why do you think that is? Like, what is it about your approach to um, SBA credit that has made you so successful? I honestly attribute a lot of it to my experiences at CIT. Um, Ray, the Ray Cantwells, the Brendan mm-hmm. Eccleston. You know, I don't consider myself an average person. So I knew that I wanted to continue to learn and grow. And I had great leaders that, that taught me what I needed to know. Um, with SBA, I'm, sh- I'm sure you can relate to this. You, you almost learn the hard way, right? The, the SOP when I first started was, I'm going to say it was what, about 500 pages. And then binders and binders and binders full of policy changes and the procedural notices and whatnot. And, you know, who knew that you can't have two EPCs on an SBA loan until you (laughs) underwrite one and you find out you can't have two EPCs on an SBA loan, things like that. So so I I think with SBA, anybody can make it whatever they are willing to put into it and whatever they really want to get out of it. So if if you just want to be an underwriter, that's fine. Um, I knew that I was early enough in my career to make something of it. Um, I think the, the, more, the more you work with different people at different levels of experience, like you were a little greener, uh, you had a lot more to learn. So I, I could almost put that question back on you about, you know, now you're becoming this, this great podcast leader. I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed with how you linked into your advantage, but you've grown considerably in the role and you know, it, it, I think it's what you want to make out of it. I agree. It, Cause you, you know? if you go into it, think, I think you know, I want to learn, I want to grow. And I mean, you are obviously not average. You graduated with a 4.0 with honors from your college <laughs> and <laughs> um, no, but I agree. Cause if you go in with that mentality, you know, along the way, you just absorb stuff like a sponge and certainly at when my six years at ready capital mm-hmm. absorbing from you uh, john costco and ray cantwell the credit people uh it has you know given me that's like one of my secret weapons how i'm able to go mm-hmm. out to mar- market today and be successful because i have this mm-hmm. sort of informal credit training from like you said mm-hmm. working working the hard way <laughs> as a credit person Um, dealing with BDOs who tend to Mm -hmm. be a little different. Like, what is that like? And what's your, what do you think the best approach is for dealing with BDOs who may not always agree with your credit decision? I think a lot of it goes back to the type of relationship you build outside of just the sales and credit role, right? So the the face-to-face meetings, realizing that people on the other side of the phone are still a real person. And, and you may have some synergies, um, you know, that you find out about there. I, I think back to when I was first underwriting at CIT, there were a lot of different personalities with the BDOs there. Um, but a lot of it is, it's just figuring out it's something together. You know, I, I like to think that I'm a deal maker, right? I, I had a vision to, to try to find a way to make every deal work. And sometimes they just don't. With SBA, there is no black and white. There's a lot of gray in some cases. And it's understanding the deals and and being creative and not just, you know, I I pick up my pen, I put my pen down. Um, Some of that comes from how well the BDOs can kind of pre-vet their deals or, you know, how much do you know about your own deal as a salesperson? If you know very little about it, it might make the underwriter's job a lot harder to do because now they're they're starting from scratch and they're they're trying to be the BDO in a way. Right. Um, but it's really building that that relationship. At the end of the day, we're we're all on the same team. There should you, be it's a empathy. common I think way. It's empathy. Yeah, and a common way to to work together. It goes on both sides. It isn't that the underwriter has to. Be, play nice with the BDO, the BDO has to play nice with the underwriter too, with the, un, with the credit teams too. And, yeah. and having that, that mutual um, kind of empathy and willingness to work together and, and find, I, find, figure things out together. And I, I think getting that buy-in is what's critical. So if, if, an, if a credit is seeing that there's a deal that might not work, it isn't just saying this is all we can do. It's let's have a conversation. Let's figure out what we think could work together. And I think having, having the, the both sides be part of that create creative process makes it more successful than, than let's say the, the credit team having 
conversations in a silo separate from the BDO and saying, this is the only way we're, we'll do it, you know, so that there is that buy-in on, on both sides. I, I want to go a little deeper on that because this is such a uh, important point in our, in our business, because I think more and more shops have been implementing the pre-screen method where mm -hmm. someone is seeing the deal before it gets to the underwriter's desk. Because mm -hmm. if you don't do that, there's a chance that a deal can fall on your desk as an underwriter and you're, and you can just say, this is so far out of the mm -hmm. realm of possibility. Like, why is this on my desk? And then mm -hmm. you gotta be the, you gotta be the bad guy. So if you pre bet mm -hmm. takes a lot of that out. And then the, I would say the BDO, like you, you kind of have to go into deals as a credit person. Like you, mm -hmm. you, you have to be the underwriter in the field. And mm -hmm. then the underwriter has to understand, you know, it, we're, we're a sales organization, there's sales, imp, you know, um, things that are involved in this. So you can't just say no, your approach for coming up with maybe an alternative solution to something, even just the attitude of being able to say that, and also your willingness, your, your specifically your willingness always to get on the phone with whoever and try to figure mm -hmm. something out. It's just that was, I would, I appreciate it as a BDO and it helped build, you know, um, that relationship, which is mm -hmm. like, like we keep saying so important. I'd almost call it like having a day in the life of, right? So if, yes. if, if the BDO had a day in the life of the underwriting team or the underwriting team had a day in the life of the BDO, I think they could have that empathy or that build that relationship together better. And, and even to help explain the whys behind things. So if we were working a deal together and it wasn't working for me to just say, Ray, it's not going to work. That doesn't help you. That doesn't help you try to figure out how to structure the next deal. But if I can say, this is why it's not going to work, but this is what I think can, you know, is it an SBA SOP thing? Is it a, uh, you know, a, a, a credit uh, guideline at the institution you're at thing? I think that helps you become a better BDO by helping you understand why something may or may not work right. I feel like you were a BDO in disguise this whole time anyway. That's why I feel like your transition to your current role was just uh, so seamless for you. I, I was actually supposed to get into the BDO role when I was at CIT. And mm. we were teeing up for that pre-recession. Once the secondary market collapsed, it was like, all right, I know that I'm not going to be a BDO. So I, I kind of gave up on that. Um, and then it, it, it kind of fell into my lap where I am now. So it, it, and I love it. I love what I do. And, but I do think that my credit background is what gives me an edge. Did anything change for you in your new role in, this, in how you look at a new deal? Well, I feel like I could, I could pre-qual it myself in a way because I have that credit side. Um, really deciding what you want to focus on and, and what kind of deals you want to go after. You know, it, it was a struggle because here I'm a small shop. I don't want to say I can't help some smaller customers, but I also can't build a business on fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollar deals. So, you know, understanding why some shops have that minimum loan size, um, right. understanding now the secondary market, and you know how the structuring of the deal impacts that aspect of the SBA process. Um, you know, going from a me, me being a decision maker to um, having to sell the deal to other people within, you know, the, the credit organization um, and having them understand why it makes sense under the SBA program versus under a conventional program. I think my, my biggest challenge was adjusting from being a non-bank SBA lending company employee to being a bank okay. employee. That right? makes sense. And, and having to adjust to now, you know, some, some of the regs that you may not have had to follow. I don't mean SBA regs, but um, some of the other regs, you know, because we weren't, we weren't governed the same way as a non-bank lending company that now, now we do as a bank. So that was probably my bigger struggle than moving into the role that I'm in. I'm re pretty much exclusively sourcing my deals internally. So we have, a, we have about 50 branches and it was really educating them on what an SBA loan is, why you want to, why the bank wants to do an SBA loan, 
um, in order for me to start getting my business. So I, I didn't have a book of business going into the role that I'm in now. And, and it was really um, starting from scratch. I appreciate you stopping by today. It was very insightful. Thanks, Ray. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. It was great to see you.